Hello, and welcome to the Argyle CFO Leadership Forum, Finance Evolution 2024. My name is Nick with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors' virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary material, information, and meeting great opportunities. For those seeking CPE credit today, you must answer at least three polling questions and remain on the session for its duration. Polls can be found under the polls tab on the right hand side of your console next to chat. Afterwards, if you are eligible to receive credit, you will receive an email with a link to your certificates. If you have any questions on credits, please email cpe at argyleforum.com. To ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat and we will address your questions at the end of the session. Now, without further delay, I would like to introduce the moderator, Stacy Snyder, Senior Vice President, Finance and Accounting Direct Hire, Addison Group. We're super excited to have Stacy and our panelists for a panel discussion titled Finance Talent Focus, Cultivating a Resilient Team. Welcome, Stacy. Over to you. Thanks so much, Nick. I greatly appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, as Nick mentioned, my name is Stacey Snyder. I am Senior Vice President of Finance and Accounting Executive with Addison Group. I am an accountant by trade, um, but have been doing executive recruiting in the accounting and finance space for the last 14 years, seven of those being with Addison and then prior to that being at Robert Half. I am excited to be here today and to introduce my fellow panelists. Um, so without further ado, Carla, would you like to go ahead and kick us off and introduce yourself? Uh, thanks, Stacy. My name is Carla Rodriguez. I'm a CPA in the New York City area. I have over 20 years of experience in accounting and finance. The last 10 years, I've been in financial management, driving transformative initiatives in various growing organizations. Currently, I work at YPTC in the controller and CFO space for not-for-profit communities, and I'm excited to be a part of this discussion today. Awesome. Welcome, Carla. Thank you so much. You. And Marshall, off to you. Yeah, my name is Marshall Crockett. I'm a finance and business services director at UC Santa Cruz. I manage the extension division. Um, I've been there for just under a year. And before that, I worked at Rivian in the financial systems area as they went public. And before that, I spent a long bit of time at uh, big four consulting firms where I focus on finance transformation, IPO readiness, and enterprise performance management. Awesome. Well, both of your experiences should definitely make for a great panel today. So again, thank you for your time. And without further ado, let's get kicked off. So our first question is, uh, from your experience, what training programs are most effective in enhancing the skills of finance professionals and why? And Carla, I believe that you're going to lead us off on this one. Yeah, sure. No, I, I, mean, I think um, starting my career in the big four, I was used to a lot of training. Um, both um, within the organization and at the time aspiring to be a CPA. I was already ramped up for CPEs. So um, I think what's a great mix is when you have company sponsored and then you have autonomy to choose your own. So it helps you choose your path. I think obviously there's like the technical and, you know, especially with the technology being so much at the forefront now for accounting as well, there's like the technical accounting skills and then there's a there's technical for like some of the data support so a lot of those kind of like a mix but then now that you see changes in the accounting and finance um, realm in general where it's not just technical skills they need what i think really should be like a was called soft skill and now really a necessary skill of of some leadership skills communication Cross training, you know, with different departments. So I think, you know, it's it's really lended itself to kind of expanding what training looks like. But I think again, 
having the company offer programs and allow employees to kind of choose their own as well. And sometimes if it's not exactly in the accounting area, it allows to kind of bring that skill set to the table and like it allows for different kind of collaboration and contribution. Awesome. Marshall, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things that I see. One is like there's a it's almost like a free credit you get at most companies to just learn. So it's like, how are you using that strategically? Um, if I kind of look back over the years, that's one thing that I always encourage others to do as well as myself. And then I think the other piece really comes down to having that overall sense of direction in your career and helping your team identify where their passions are and, and making sure that whether you're a mentor or a sponsor of that um, in the short term or long term, you're really helping them think through what's the next step and opportunity you can give them. Yeah, I think. Um... So I'm coming from a recruiting perspective and I get asked a lot. It's not just the technical, but I need someone with, you know, a strong level of emotional intelligence or, you know, um, all of those things. And so I think that a growth of an employee isn't just that technical part, right? It, it's kind of as an overall individual as well. So any support that we can give them um, in training and development, I definitely think will obviously help us move forward in the future. So we're going to move on to our next question. And Marshall, I think you're going to lead us on this one. But how can mentorship be structured within finance teams, to maximize professional growth and prepare individuals for a new role? Yeah, so I think one thing is, is when we step back just overall, there's a strategy to think about. And it really comes down to the types of collaboration and feedback. So what are the structured and unstructured ways you receive that feedback? and how people can re actually receive it, right? There's one thing to just be providing it because it's part of your role as a leader, but two, for your team to be receptive and you to see the benefits, um, that starts to be something. And part of that are the sessions you have where you're able to provide that direct one-on-one -on -one feedback, whether it's a quarterly discussion or you know real time while you're working on something, but two, it's the team dynamic you're able to foster. So thinking about not just how you're communicating to the team, but giving the other team members the, the ability to do the self-critique and support. Um, I, I think that drives a big, big piece of it. Um, Carla, have you seen that before or what is, what's your experience? Absolutely. So, you know, again, just as you said, um, you know, giving that opportunity to the team to add their input. Um, I think on the side of, you know, mentoring, and we offer mentor opportunities without any kind of goal in mind. Sometimes it's like a blanket and something open ended where, you know, um, there, there is no goal at the end. It just becomes, okay, you know, just learn what I need to learn, or, you know, not associated with any promotion or whatnot. So I think, you know, uh, I, I like to always have something at the end, like what, what will be the end result? Are we working towards something? Yeah. yeah. And what I've seen has been kind of cool too is the whole notion of a mentor versus a sponsor where one, just giving them the vision as opposed to being able to create those opportunities for them. And even in my own career, you know, when I first started working, it was, um, I was working for very small companies on QuickBooks and doing things, you know, the turn of the 2000s <laughs> where it was uh, after the dot-com bust. And automation became a thing. Whereas, you know, if we were to fast forward to now, we've automated it. <laughs> this is what it looks like. And so there's certain skill sets that are just sort of basic for finance roles, whereas they were really unique when I had started. And then looking at those trends to the future, I think it's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think you always often hear that phrase is like um, employees don't leave jobs, they leave bosses. I think it can be the same thing for environments, too. And and the most important environment is that team environment. And um, what's becoming more and more important um, for individuals that are entering the workforce, but then also making a change um, as they're looking for new roles is, you know, how can I impact? What What is the ability for me to make an impact on the team, um, mentorship opportunities, ability to really add to the overall 
culture um, of that team is something that um, employees are really looking to have a voice and to have the ability to step in and, and really help kind of guide what that looks like within those groups. They work so closely together on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, those things are just becoming more and more important for individuals as they're looking for new opportunities. So Carla, what strategies can be used for succession planning and hiring new leaders? So I love talking about succession planning. I think that a lot of organizations don't see the importance or the value of it. And I think some at the same time think it's, um, you know, we don't have the account, we don't have the resources, but it's so much more than that. Um, there is opportunity for um you know, cross-training, leadership training, 360 reviews, uh, one-on-ones to understand. I think, um, you know, creating your own talent pipeline, right? Um, and how do you, how do you really do that? Like, how, it's like easy to say, right? But how I've always seen that is, you know, you can have, um, you can, set up these meetings one-on-ones often 360s but to really understand like you know you have certain roles that you need to fill and that whether people get promoted there's going to be vacancies again whether it's a promotion or someone leaves or you know whatever it is so i think it's really important to be ready for these at any time but if we're not having conversations to understand people's interests skills passions we can't you know, move them toward these roles. So I think, you know, also on the same, that's a lot of internal talk, but, you know, at the same time, there's, you know, are we looking at our external pipeline or, you know, are we having conversations with, you know, our, you know, networks, you know, for recruiting and, and how, how is that pipeline looking? So I think, um, again, I think that companies really need to focus a lot on the succession planning, whether it be, you know, building internal pipelines or networking externally. I think both is very valuable, but, you know, um, cross-training, there was, you know, um, we've seen where you could work in a different department. Like, I think that's great as well. You know, and, uh, you know, it teaches so much and you can come back and contribute, but it doesn't mean you have to, you know, work in a succession plan, but it could just so happen that, oh, I like doing that. And and then the position's available. So, and you roll right in. So like, I think, you know, the same with like shadowing opportunities. We do that currently at my company, like we shadow and then learn what someone else does. Um, I think that's really important. But if, you know, um, like come up for air, so to speak, you're, you're constantly doing your ABC, what you have to do the day, you're not going to have exposure to what's lateral, what's above, and, and there's no way that someone could roll into that role, or even maybe, maybe they like it, maybe they don't, but they really don't know. So I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to approach it, but I think it's really important for companies to understand the value. Absolutely. Marshall, what are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, so I actually agree with a lot of what Carla had described, and I think that acknowledging as well um, sort of the diversity of the team where some people may be prepared for a faster track as opposed to landing at a company or an organization and, and really then needing a couple of years to get stable. Um, you know, if I were to step back and look at the skills or capabilities someone would need, to be successful, sort of identifying those areas and how it aligns with the succession plan um, as opportunities. A big trend I've noticed since I left Big Four Accounting is at Rivian and at the university, really, it's a different talent pool. So you're not just purely recruiting from like a pool of more junior resources for that external focus. Um, and when you are bringing people in, and they're at a junior level, um, they have years of experience in another area. So how do you sort of cross train and bring them up? And when they actually have a passion for finance or accounting and they historically weren't included in the pool of talent. Yeah. And, and so keeping that as a funnel as well. Yeah. I like to ask a lot is what does growth mean to you? I think that um, I, I think that that looks different for everyone and there's not a one size fits all. Just like what does work-life balance look like to you?
does growth look like to you? And, you know, you're going to get a lot of different answers. You know, for some individuals, it's compensation. For some individuals, it's title change. But for some people, it's simply, I grew a skill set or I learned something that maybe I didn't know before. And so I, I really do think it's important to really understand what growth does mean and, and what that looks like individually on your team to be under, to understand what strengths you might have. You might have individuals that want to be able to step up and to leadership roles. And that path is going to, and, and their mentorship is going to look a lot different than someone that wants to grow their skills only and wants to be a good team player and, and, and all of those things. And <clears throat> again, I mentioned this previously, but that pipelining and that kind of growth opportunity, those are must-haves now whenever individuals are looking for new jobs. Um, you, you know, it can top a compensation. It can top a lot of different things on what does my path look like? What does my impact to this organization look like? Um, and we really, you know, need to start selling what those potential opportunities are. And that doesn't mean that your company has to experience a tremendous amount of growth. You can offer those things such as the cross training, um, you know, mentorship opportunities, even if there's not a specific leadership position open, allowing those senior individuals to step in and really have ownership and, and help help you um, build out a more robust team while also fulfilling their um, their kind of goals and, and long-term career um, career development as well. And I, I just want to say, Stacey, I, I love, you know, how you asked the question, you know, what does growth mean to you? Because absolutely, you know, it's funny when you were first saying it, I'm like, oh, you know, I could name 10 things, but I know the person next to me is going to, you know, have another 10 things for them. So, you know, absolutely. And, and I think that is an important question to make sure you're asking your team. Yeah, I think, again, I think. And it's not intentionally, we just like, okay, well, my growth plan looks the same as the person next to me. There were both accountants, so it's got to be the same. And, and it's really not. It, it takes all kinds of kinds, right? And so you're going to have those individuals that do want to be leaders because they're natural born leaders. Maybe they were um, in sports in school or team captains of, of a debate team or something like that. But then you're going to have those more independent contributor individuals as well. And that is fulfillment for them. They maybe get, um, you know, fulfillment out outside on hobbies or um, extracurricular or something like that, but that's fulfillment for them. And if we just assume that your growth is the same as their growth plan, um, you know, I, I think that we're just overlooking a lot um, of potential opportunity to really help tailor each individual's um, growth plan and their career path. So Marshall, this leads us to our next one. What qualities or skills should potential candidates possess when hiring new finance talent? Yeah, so I think of this in terms of really a capability model, right? Um, if you think about it, there, in my mind, um, there's probably 20, 25 capabilities if I were to just start jotting down the list. But you quickly run into the roadblock that half of them are subjective, right? They they really are like the manager's view of someone's skill as opposed to that demonstrated skill. Yeah. And so what I start to think of are what are the key capabilities or components that you'd like to see? And I think one is we've talked about it. It's the sense and passion for learning, right? Um, being able to understand when a problem is well-defined or not well-defined and uh, then being able to have a set of skills that they can use in that poorly defined area. Um, you know, I think peer relationships, cultural and team alignment, approachability, understanding others are some of those skills where you as a manager drive a lot of how that is sort of culturally grown on your team or in an organization or with your peers. And so a lot of that can be taught. I think there's other skills when we talk about the mindset for planning or process management or being able to identify risks, directing others' work, where you need to be able to think of the team or the person you're potentially hiring as, can you help them in that area directly? And then two, at some point, do they have the trust to be able to do it autonomously? Um, and, and that's really what I'm really about. And then the rapport, I think, usually comes in interviews from someone seeing it enough. So they're not answering it with a too vague a response. Yeah. Carla, what are your thoughts on this? 
So, um, of course, you know, technical skills and being able to do the job as others, but, you know, what I look for is adaptability, flexibility, passion for doing, you know, um, obviously the, the job that we need, um, you know, uh, Marshall mentioned like before, like, are you able to have those conversations, build the trust, influence decisions and, and things like that? Um, I feel like again, more and more, there's more cross collaboration in departments and and needing to know a lot of different skills now. It's not just put your head on your desk and and you know bring me some numbers, right? It's it's you have to research, you have to coordinate with other departments. You know, are you able to do that? But I think again, in this changing space, you know, are you adaptable? Are you flexible? How are you going to handle these these problems or these issues that come up? Um, new new technology comes up. Can you you know work with you know AI or whatever it is? Like, are you able to you know get all this data and and make it into these nice reports? So you know a lot of the questions that I like to ask are situational. Like, what have you done in this situation? And when it didn't go the way you thought, then what happened? Like, talk to me about a time when you were challenged or that you you know you were offered a project that wasn't in your real house. So, you know, just to kind of have that conversation and, and see, see, you know, how they take on new projects. I feel like, um, I'm sure you both see this all the time, but, you know, you think you're going to do one thing and then 800 things comes out and exactly. like, oh, we have to fix that, we have to do that. And that needs to be improved. And, you know, it's just never one thing. So it's important for me to make sure my team is very flexible and adaptive. Yeah, I think um, when I look at this, um, whenever you're building out a team, big, small, um, I, I try to look for what are my strengths currently on my team? Where are my weaknesses on my team? And in this new person, where can they add the most value? And I'm, I'm probably looking for an area that I have maybe some weaknesses or, or lack of whether it's experience, um, whatever that is, because I think one of the the most important things about a team is it being well-rounded having different perspectives really helps um one i think a collaborative um environment pinging ideas off of each other um learning growing because I probably have a different perspective and way of doing things than Marshall and Carla, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that that's an opportunity for us all to learn about each other and how maybe we can look at and approach things a little bit differently. So when I'm looking at building out my team and or honestly, when a client calls me and they're like, I need to hire X, Y, Z person okay, well, where are you shy on your team? Are there are there gaps on your team that you really feel like um, is a weakness for you? Let us try to focus on um, finding talent that will help you strengthen that. Um, and so I don't think it's a one size fits all on, on what skills they have to have. I think it's important on looking at your current team, seeing where you are and then how you can be better and build upon um, that foundation that you have. Yeah, and I've noticed that this is another trend where it's like the maturity of the company and the baseline of what you would expect, right? So technology being another example of just to changing so much in the past five years or the past two years. Um, as a former consultant for now I'm a divisional controller, the difference is that divisional controller most likely would not have had consulting experience. Whereas when you know, I got my role that was kind of in the DNA that everybody had done some type of consulting or transformation work. Um, and then thinking about that as the team you're trying to hire as well, those skill sets, um, like having dashboarding as an experience, making sure somebody gets that in the first year as opposed to, you know, 10 years ago, that had been one person's experience in that same time period. So sort of being able to think through those opportunities, whereas it may be routine for you, it's a great opportunity to learn for others as things change. I do think, um, and I'm not sure where the shift um, came, but I do think that there was a very clear shift in, um, you know, historically hiring managers liking to hire themselves. So, hey, just find a copy of me and we'll be good, right? Um, and, and I think that um, we did that so much to where, 
um, honestly, I, I think it just creates a lot of conflict and you don't really grow because you're constantly working with yourself. And if you have, if you're the same person, again, you're, you're not going to have that ability to bounce ideas off of each other, grow and, and learn and expand your knowledge base. And so um, at least in the last 14 years, you know, I can't tell you how many times um, when I first started, it's like, just find me a clone of me, just find me me. Right. And now it's like, find me better than me, find me, you know, 10 years years ago, but with this. And so um, I, I think it's just very interesting um, how as leaders, we have evolved to really embrace differences um, because we've really learned that those can have a very valuable impact. I think not only us on us as leaders, because I do, I think that us managing different individuals other than just ourselves, um, I think just makes us stronger human beings because it, there is that level of emotional intelligence and empathy that you have to have to be able to say, okay, this person's views are different. This person likes to be managed this way. So I'm going to have to be very proactive and very intentional in my, you know, um, management of this individual to make sure that they have the best possible experience. Um, and that does put a little bit of extra work on leaders, right? To kind of go out of their way to make sure that, that we're leading these individuals the way that they need to be led versus maybe the way that we've always been led or we were taught to lead um, many years ago. I love that. And I, I think, you know, I've been hearing this a lot lately is like meet them where they are. But I, I think completely um, just what you said, like the diversity in the teams is so important now. Uh, different talents, different backgrounds, because exactly as you said, you bring different things. I, if, if I'm not saying in my group, like, wow, I didn't think of it like that. Like, I'm not happy. Right. Because like from all levels, whether it's above side below, it's, it's, well, wow, I'm so glad we, we talked about this. I didn't even think about it like this. And, and it takes you down a whole other place. Like you said, if it's me talking to me, um, we, we go in the same line almost every time. Right. But then, or, or maybe you divert a little bit, but then when you, when you take someone else and they're like, Oh, well, I've always done it like this, or I, I would think of it like that. And, and you're just like, wow, that that's great. Let's, let's, let's go down that road. So, you know, absolutely. And I think, you know, that's like a big thing you know, that I, I, you know, you touched on that, that I do look for that, that um, I didn't bring up today, but it's definitely to add some diversity in the group and diversity of thought in, in addition to all kinds of backgrounds as well. Marshall, do you have any additional thoughts on just um, driving diversity on your finance teams? Yeah. So, you know, I actually think this has been an evolution for me again, going from being a consultant, right? So it was very contractual. I do this for an X period of time and then I move on to the next project where I have, you know, 10 clients, part of them are during IPO season to um, being an operator. And I do think part of it is being responsible for not just the team, but the results, right? And accountable. Uh, and then I think the other big shift is really just being open and listening. Um, there's a lot of times when you, you know, you're sitting across the table from someone in an interview and they're trying to tell you their capability or their ability or how they can add value. And yeah. you have to be able to listen to that and then truly think about the business objectives. Uh, I think that's definitely think that's something that I see. And then in, a, in actual business setting, um, I find that drives tremendous value. I try to um, I try to avoid any any time I'm going into any any type of meeting with my individuals is I try to avoid not asking open ended questions. Um, it's now this is something I've had to learn because I um, very early on I wanted to answer the question for them or I wanted to lead the question right um, and then and then I matured and and I learned and I grew. And I learned that the more open-ended questions that I asked, the more I got out of my employees and the better our conversations were, right? I, was, I wasn't I was being assumptive. I, I wasn't um, swaying it one way or, or one or the other way, um, but really open-ended questions really helped me understand my employees a lot better. And again, um, what they're looking for as well and what they need um, for, for growth and, and development. Yeah. Um, as I've gone through the, you know, 
over the past two or three years, a career, career transition myself, also thinking internally around what I wanted 10 years ago and now the skills I'm trying to gain. <laughs> that's also been informative as opposed to, you know, relying to where I had a very clear vision inside of a firm and then seeing the bigger transition now with um, uh, in the finance area where there are layoffs and there have been in the past and thinking about those key skills that regardless of your role are truly intrinsic and valuable. Um, you know, I think certifications and having that background around finance and accounting, it's something I pivoted to. It's actually a large reason why I work at the university now, right? It's if I step back and look, where could I gain that experience and also provide the business value at the same time, it, it seemed like a, a natural fit and just lifelong learning that I see a lot of people doing that continue to stay up on their CP, CPEs and um, um, pursue other credentials. Awesome. We're going to move on to one of my favorites, um, and it is what are the most uh, effective ways to retain top finance talent, especially in a competitive job market. So Carla, I think that you're going to lead us off on this one, but I can't wait to, to share my input and thoughts as well. I can't wait to hear from you and um, Marshall as well, but I, I do have my own thoughts. And again, um, most obvious competitive compensation, um, you know, uh, wellness programs, I think a focus on wellness, um, strong culture. I think sometimes the culture is so much talked about, but it's not, you know, um, sometimes it's hard to really quantify exactly, you know, what they're getting from a culture, but, you know, to make sure there's a, a strong lens on the culture within the organization, because it's very important. Um, career progression, like you, you talked about it earlier, like, you know, what are, what are the paths, right? What are the opportunities for growth? It may not be, I want to be promoted. It, it may be, I want, I want a title. I do want more money. I, I want, I don't, I want more responsibility or, you know, like you said, some individual contributors just like, I want my job next year. Right. So what are, <laughs> what are, you know, what's, what's driving everyone. And, and again, I think it, it all comes back to the communication, the, the meetings, the understanding what they want, but I think also you know, showing the commitment to the employee, right? Whether it's the employee well-being, the, the culture, the growth, just making sure that at all times, like we are, um, we have the lens on, you know, what we're offering and we're strong with that. And again, it may be a company that is strong in their culture, but maybe their conversation isn't there. Or we're strong on well-being and we want to make sure there's enough, you know, PTO and, and everything else in that bucket, but it's to really kind of double down on what you're offering. Marshall, what are your yeah. thoughts on this? Looking forward to Marshall and uh, Stacey now. Yeah, so um, looking at some of the that are coming in, I think it actually goes back to like how you measure effectiveness and it's about it overall for, for people. Um, you know, I really do think that to remain competitive, there's a question of managing effectiveness, not just for yourself personally, but like your role on the team. And overall, if someone were to walk in blind, right, how can you kind of summarize the value you're, you're driving? Um, you know, something I definitely feel is strong is being able to think about what that looks like in like in consulting. You would often think about that proposal or pitch where you're summarizing everything. But, you know, in a typical finance function, the shift really is around working with your business partners and then clearly understanding that value you bring and then partnering with them on things as they go to market and you supporting it um, or even being in the face in the front of it sometimes. Right. Like whether it's raising funds or helping with the operational challenge on, with data. Um, I think that partnering ends up being a piece. And then it's also where when you look at your team, who's able to do that as part of their role um, and give them other opportunities to do that and, and really let it teach and inform, you know, what you're doing with resources. So for me, I think uh, this is a loaded question because, I, again, I think it goes back to it's not a one size fits all. I think the number one most important thing is understanding what's important to your employees. Um, you can have five employees and have five different things that are important to them. Um, if you would have asked 14 years ago, I would have said, um, you know, 401k pay and vacation time. Those were like the most three things. Like, I don't care about anything else but those. Um, and, you know, I think COVID taught us a lot about 
flexibility, work-life balance, and that we can juggle and manage it all. And so now, you know, again, um, someone might be extremely happy if um, their boss gives them a very flexible schedule. The boss knows they get the job done. They're not, they're not concerned about that, but they don't ever miss a football practice for their children, right? That's important to them. And if they can still feel like they are able to meet those personal obligations and still meet their work obligations, that's going to be um, very, very important to them. Um, uh, you know, another, another scenario would be um, a growth. I, I want to be challenged. I want you, you know, I know that I, I don't know everything, but when possible, I want to be brought in on things that um, maybe, you know, are a little bit above my head, but will force me to learn and all of those things. They, they want to know that um, they're valued and, and that they're important and that what's important to them is important to you. And I think, again, there's no one size fits all. You really need to tailor that approach to each individual person. Um, because by doing the whole one size fits all, you are going to lose some of your top talent. All righty, last question before we hit Q&A. How can finance teams foster a culture of continuous learning and how does this impact performance? Marshall, you're up. Yeah, so I think uh, an important thing here is to really look at the shifts we've seen before and um, really how this is accounted for, right? So benefits were very well defined, um, whereas now there are a lot of soft benefits and I am really thankful you know, we work, you know, across the globe and across different um, ages, because I think younger generations or ages have helped me understand in the past couple of years what it's like to work remotely, what it's like to work in a particular area. And regardless of where you're working, um, understanding what are the key components of building the team and a very early stage in their career, identifying what are possible paths to development. And I think that being open to it is a big piece. Um, identifying who stakeholders are in the company. We've mentioned earlier around job cross sharing or training where they could start to form relationships. Yeah, I know at least in finance, a big area where I've always seen is corporate development or a lot with the operations or revenue um, teams being able to understand not just you're doing the books for them, right? So this was my old mentality. I, I was just doing the books <laughs> instead of that relationship <laughs> and all the people involved that really you do form, like you're fighting a battle to bring in revenue for an organization. You do form deep relationships and then sharing that and what that looks like. I, I think that's a big thing. Um, affinity groups within corporations, encouraging and fostering those and giving time for teams to actually be able to use them is another one now. Um, and then strategic partnering. Uh, a lot of times where I have seen, you know, a lot of really great leaders when I was at PwC or Ernst & Young um, and even at Rivian as they went public, really start to build that core team of high performing individuals was around pulling together people when there are problems and saying strategically, if you could just clear the slate, what would you want? And then that small group knowing they don't have control to fix everything, but consistently going back to that group and laddering to a success, um, I think is another thing that you can do to really help foster that and, and create that attitude of continuous learning and improvement. Yeah. Carla, what are your thoughts on this? So I think, you know, in order to foster a culture for continuous learning, I think the company has to really um, show that this is their, their, you know, their backing, right? So they're offering training, they're offering space for, for autonomous training, like where, you know, I can have not just company sponsored, but I can go off on my own, whether it's a budget, a money budget, a time budget, or both. And um, I think as well, allowing the space for growth. So, um, when I say that, I mean, allow room for failure, right? I think I've been hearing, I know a lot about that. Like, you know, if you come with an idea, um, you want to grow. And Marshall, you mentioned like, you know, new projects and all this, like, you know, what, all these new things. Um, how are we going to get there? Are we going to get it right the first time? And we all know the answer is most likely not. <laughs> so then what's going to happen? And, and what's going to be the risk? And what's going to be the, the consequence if we if 
we get it wrong the first time and how are we going to be allowed to bounce back and how are we going to be supported right so i think you know um there's a lot of um promoting also this autonomy and and individuality where you can you know have that space to kind of be creative and make room to fail right but make room to make better and collaborate so i think again having supportive company that knows you are going to be on this growth path so again having just that overall culture we're here to learn and grow together absolutely so let's dive into a couple of our q a's before we wrap up um so this is to either marshall or kayla um how can CFOs measure the effectiveness of training programs in terms of both immediate impact and long-term professional growth? Um, I think like how I would see it measured um, is usually on, I've seen it like, you know, associated with a goal. I know we talked about this earlier, some goals, some, whether it's individual goals, and I think it should be, you know, like linked to individual goals whether it's on a, an annual performance review, a 360 review, the same thing with, I've seen some targets within organizations, like, again, the succession planning, right? So, you know, how does that align with, you know, how we're doing with every individual or, you know, so, so on. Um, again, if it's a, a money budget, if it's a time budget, are people using that, right? And then what's the outcome? It's not just, A, we have, because I know there's so many companies like, we want we want this training, we want that training, our, and we're offering it, and we're offering money, and we're offering dates. Are they actually using it? So I think, you know, that's one area where, where it can be measured. But then again, if it's you know, yeah. successful, that's on the other end. Are we promoting? Are we are we retaining? Right? Are we making new projects and are they successful? Right. So I think there's a lot of different ways um we can we can track that. Marshall, looking forward to also hearing from you if you've seen that track. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have it. The way I primarily thought of it is from an enterprise performance management standpoint. When you think of training one as a compliance tool and you can track that, the cost of compliance and those training courses associated with it, the material and the effort put into it from a resource standpoint. And then two, when you move beyond that and you think of this lens of perf per, um, improving performance or enhancing a process, um, it really comes down to a soft measurement unless I've, you know, in my previous life, unless there was a specific project where you had captured it from a project accounting standpoint and it had been loaded and identified as part of a curriculum um, in a learning management tool, right? Like it really isn't captured. And I think the other thing you see is there's a lot of discretionary spend in departments where they're trying to train their teams on what is essentially finance. And there's a savings with, we all as finance practitioners are just able to communicate what our standard operating procedures are. Um, and I think part of that is people are afraid of the numbers. <laughs> that's another way to start to reduce some of that soft cost that you see. But definitely, I think compliance and the cost of compliance and then saying what on top of it are we trying to do to incrementally improve a process is an objective measure. Absolutely. So our next question is, how can CFOs balance offering career development opportunities with the immediate needs of the finance department? Yeah, so my opinion on this, and it really comes back to thinking about when a company goes public, right? So the first question is, if there's a training need and it would prevent you from going public, what are you going to do? You're going to pay for the training need, right? <laughs> when you think about what's critical in that lens, um, certain decisions become really fast. It's when there's not a peril or a big situation in front of you, this question around training cost comes up and it really comes back to your basic commitment. When times are tight and when times are loose, there should be a certain portion of your resources allocated towards training and retaining your, your teams. Otherwise, you're just purely basing it on you being a nice person and people being able to understand that and them wanting to work with you, which I think is great some of the time. But again, there are challenges when times are tight where that doesn't necessarily translate into retention. retention. Yeah, absolutely. Carla, is there anything you'd like to add on that? 
I think, you know, I feel the same that Marshall said when you have, you know, a target and, you know, there's a there's a need. I think the one thing that you want to, you know, balance is, you know, this is the whole group, this is for a select individual. But I think, you know, they're they're you know, you have the target and, you know, you'd have to obviously deal with the budget, right? So that's like something else, both time and 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 money wise. But you know, I think, you know, basically it would be it would come down to those. Awesome. All right. So next up is what are some common pitfalls in building a leadership pipeline and how can they be avoided? That's a great I question. think all plans fall oh, apart. I, yeah. I, would, I would just start with <laughs> right. all plans fall apart. <laughs> yeah. um, there's an essential DNA to any plan. And I think this happens a lot. You see it at large organizations. You see it in finance, particularly um, around getting new talent in for the CPA. Um, you know, being able to think of those alternative pipelines as part of the strategy for finance, uh, that really is a big imperative for finance to continue because I think automation is a new player in the room. Um, the discussion around automation is expected and artificial intelligence, AI on top of it, I think that's kind of a driving imperative. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Carla? Um, I think just, you know, like, like constantly, like, obviously, again, there's going to be pitfalls, I think, just staying on top and, and, you know, just constantly, um, you know, looking for new talent and, and if, if it needs to be, you know, changing requirements or, you know, constantly evolving in that area. But yeah, like, just like we said, there's always going to be something and it's just, you know, there's always also going to be a need. So, you know, we have to balance yeah. yeah, I think that the whole thing is like continuously um, kind of reevaluating what that looks like as well, because that changes. You you set a plan for six months to a year from now, um, and, and realistically, um, you, we should be reevaluating that every month. Is this still on track? Is this still is this still working? Because it might be something that where we have to realign expectations or what we thought initially was going to uh, going to happen in a six to 12 month period is, is now much longer or much shorter. And so I think the other thing is just being more proactive as well in just really reevaluating versus putting it on the back burner and then addressing it once the, the time comes per se. So I think we've got time for maybe one or two more. So what role do diversity and inclusion initiatives play in attracting and retaining finance talent and how can they be strengthened? So I think that, you know, obviously it plays a big role. I think the, the way it can be strengthened is to make sure that there is, you know, a compliance system. Like I know there's, a, you know, speaking of technology, I know there's like a lot of new ways that you know, the HR systems and the, the, you know, pipeline systems search for talent. And I think having um, communities within the organization that um, allow for um, internal movement that make sure that it's kind of um, grouping from, you know, everyone. Um, I think again, but I think this isn't something that's passive. It has to be active and it has to be, you know, um, from the top down and, you know, and worked on and made sure that, you know, uh, that there's enough um, selection. Cause sometimes, you know, I'll interview some people and I'm like, you know, I want, I, I'm gonna need to see more than three people because, you know, this is like you were saying, like I'm getting three of me or, you know, three of Marshall or three of Stacy, right? So like, we need to see more people sometimes or just, you know, make sure that, that you know, what we're getting is is from a big bucket and not just kind of like an hour, an hour selection. Yeah. Marshall, your thoughts on this one? Um, I, I, I think that a lot of the time when people are looking for diversity and inclusion, it's not necessarily when they're taking a job. Um, it's once they're there and they look around and they're trying to belong, right? And that's what I felt myself. Um, and th that diversity really comes from being able to have the opportunity to get your ideas out or to team or to collaborate and getting those opportunities we had talked about earlier 
Stacey, you had said it very well in terms of like trying to find one of approach and apply it everywhere instead of really thinking about what's right for an individual resource. I actually think that's the best tool for diversity. Um, and then um, we're quick to say no, instead of saying, and manage the liability of the resource instead of thinking of the asset side of that resource and the long-term relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Marshall and Kayla. This was great. And thank you audience all for joining us. Um, but it is time to pass things back to Nick um, and have everybody have a great day. Great. And thank you all for such an amazing panel discussion. And I want to thank everyone else for joining us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. For those of you who earn points throughout today's event, an Argyle team member will be following up with the winners in the next couple of weeks. This officially concludes the Argyle CFO Leadership Forum Finance Evolution 2024. Thank you again for joining us today and engaging in our content. We look forward to seeing you at our next Argyle Digital Finance event soon, which will be our Finance Decision Maker Expo, live look at cutting edge tools on November 12th, 2024. Have a great rest of your day.